Hello, everyone, and welcome to Structured Series, episode number five, Creative Mentoring. We're really glad you're here, and I want to just uh, remind those of you who have been here before and welcome those of you who have not, um, that this is an interactive live session. So you uh, please turn on your chat bar so you can see what we're all talking about. I want you to uh, use it for comments and put your connections so you can add your email, websites, links, Instagram, anything you like. This is a place for you guys to, to connect with each other and with uh, the team and the speakers here. Um, the other thing is, go ahead, I'm going to do it right now as well, is if you go to your um, your your bar there, make sure that when you're doing comments, you are commenting to everyone. Um, so sometimes that doesn't naturally go there. So you or, or, you know, at first. Um, and then at the end of the whole session, the three dots to the very right at the bottom is a way to save the chat so you can save all of that information. Right now, I'd love it if you can, yeah, hello from Mexico, California, Portland, please let us know where you're from and uh, say hi, tell us who you are. Also for Q&A, if you have actual questions for the speakers, put them in the Q&A button. Uh, there, the button at the bottom of the screen here is a, an official Q&A that you can put questions in anytime. We're gonna have a Q&A at the end, but you can also ask questions while we're, while we're connecting. So I wanna start off by saying thank you to Karen Dunn and the KMD Pro team that keep this event running perfect and smoothly. Uh, Dan Bones for the opening animation, Greg Brace for the original music score, and for all of you for, for being here and connecting. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, you can find us there. We'll have a link at the end of the whole uh, episode here. If you also have any requests for speakers or topics or anything you want to hear about in Structure Series, throw those in the comments as well. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, pick up on that. All right, let's get started. I want to introduce our two guests today. Um, they will also introduce themselves, but I want to give them a little introduction here. First guest, uh, Karuna Scheinfeld. Uh, she, she is the chief product officer for the brand Roots. And uh, she has been on, with Structure before, a speaker in the past. And um, she is a, a wonderful uh a design leader. She's a natural mentor. And um, she, with a start that she started out with brands like Ralph Lauren, Dolce & Gabbana, Alexander McQueen. She's had design leadership roles at American Eagle Outfitters, Abercrombie & Fitch, and a VP of design positions at Woolrich and Canada Goose. Um, and so her experience across fashion and the outdoor industry is very wide and also very, very deep with her knowledge. Our second guest, Howie Schwartz, is a longtime music industry veteran founder of Howard Schwartz Recording in New York City. And uh, we'll talk plenty about that as well. He is also you know, a mentor right now. That's one of the things he does on a regular basis. He started as a graduate from the Eastman School of Music. He did a stint as a DJ for the Armed Forces Radio in Europe during the Vietnam War. Um, and then he moved into being a recording engineer and a mixer for rock bands in the early 70s. He knows a lot of folks. So he landed in New York City uh, to start what would, over, the, over about 40 years time, become one of the largest recording complexes in the U.S. So I want to welcome to the screen Karuna and Howie. Please join us. Hello, hello. You have your mics on? Yep. Hi. There you go. Hi. We're here. I got a couple of New Yorkers here. So. <laughs> I don't talk like that, but that's okay. <laughs> I know I that. I'm, I'm a, a, what is it, a Nancy, an accent? I'm from Buffalo originally, but been yeah, in New York since 1972. Long time. Well, I'm a, ca I'm a Californian, not talking very well as a New Yorker, so I'm not going to even try. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, before we get started, I want to, I, I introduced you already, but I want to take a quick 30 seconds for each of you just to say, you know, introduce yourself, say who you are, what you are doing now. We're going to dig into all your past stuff. Um, but Karuna, why don't you start, just um, say hello to everyone. And sure. Hi, um, happy to be here. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Howie. Um, I am currently in Toronto, Canada, um, working for Roots, which is a, a really great, almost 50 year old brand. Um, and I'm the chief product officer. So what that means is that I oversee all design, merchandising, sourcing, product development, and material R&D, which is 
mm. fantastic. It gives me like a, an amazing purview to really control product and bring amazing things to life. And we have a leather factory here that's been running for three generations um, mm. where we do a lot of handcrafted, beautiful products. So I, I still love getting into the factory on a daily basis. Mm. That's always been something you've loved. So that's great. You can still do that within a big company like that. So cool. How about you, Howie? Uh, where do I begin? Um, uh, just a quick introduction. We're going to dig into the rest in a minute. <laughs> all right. My elevator speech. Uh, I'm Howie Schwartz. Uh, I'm a, a four, ugh, 40 year veteran of the music, television, uh, music, uh, television, radio, film industry. Um, I had uh, a large recording studio in, in New York City, which uh, I, uh, retired from a while ago. Mm. And uh, now I'm uh, hanging out in the Hudson Valley uh, in middle upstate New York, and I'm a mentor. Uh, and um, I dabble in real estate. And uh, I do things like this a lot. And it's fun. And you're also a um, grandfather again. Oh, yes. Grandfather, <laughs> second time Friday. <laughs> I had a little, uh, another little grandson. His name is Dylan Levi Goodstat. Awesome. Mm. So yeah, he's uh, seven pounds, 10 ounces, 20 inches long. Well, I'm glad you can make it with all of that going on too. So uh, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot, but yes. I actually played golf the other day. So that was good. Well, good. Too. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> Well, starting off with that, speaking of, uh, of little kids, I wanted to really kind of start off with the early days and cutting our teeth. Like um, uh, the first half of this talk, I really want to talk about um, your backgrounds. I really, I like to dig into where we come from, you know, our guests and whatnot, because it's not just talking about being a mentor. It's about the pathway of how you got where you are and your experiences all the way through that. And so, you know, for the first half hour, I really want to talk about your backgrounds, and um, we can incorporate that, you know, those pieces of like, who was a mentor for you, or, um, you know, I, I like to think about like, who are those angels that gave you that lift up, or who were those brick walls that stood in your way, or the saboteurs who kind of, you know, maybe kind of threw a curveball into your plan or whatnot. Um, so those can kind of make their way in, but for the first few minutes here, I want to, you know, I want to really talk about where you started, you know, that young place. Um, Karuna, I want to start with you. And, you know, you kicked off your career, I guess, with, you know, working for fashion brands in New York. Um, yeah. Ralph yeah. Lauren, you know, we talked about that, whatnot. Um, tell me a little bit about that start for you. Um, I'm going to go back a tiny bit earlier than that, okay. which is I grew up in Chicago and my parents were both academics and um, avid outdoors people and had no interest in fashion whatsoever. Um, and, and I went to a school that was, uh, you know, very academic school and, and kind of knew how to get people to an Ivy League college education, but had no, I didn't have a lot of connections into, in terms of pathways into the arts. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was lucky enough when I was 13 to have a home ec class with B. Harris. And uh, it, this home ec class completely changed my life. I mean, I started learning how to sew. B. Harris was like my first real mentor. Mm. And she is still one of the most amazing people I know. She's in her late seventies living on the South side of Chicago. Wow. And I spent, I spent probably from 13 to 18, just as much time as I could with B. Mm -hmm. So like when I was done with all my other classes, I went back to her classroom and we would talk, we would sew, we would make stuff. I worked for her every summer, just any job she would give me, you know, like sewing pearls on a wedding dress she was making for her neighbor, like whatever it was. Yeah. And, uh, and she was a huge influence on me. I mean, she was a really cool lady, but also taught me everything about, about making stuff. And, and so when I got, when it became time to go to, to go to college, I didn't, wasn't really interested in, I was, you know, I was interested in making clothes. So I, mm -hmm. I had no idea what to do and nobody in my school could really help me. So I found out about Parsons and everyone said that was the best school. So I said, well, what do you got to do to get into Parsons? Well, you have to have a drawing portfolio. So then I figured out how to make a drawing portfolio. I went there for the summer to New York for the first time. 
and uh, applied early admission with all the work I did the whole summer and got in and went to New York. So that was like coming to New York. Not, I, I wouldn't say I was a naive kid because I spent most of my time in the, the blues clubs in Chicago after I was 14 years old, but, <laughs> I, but I was um, definitely not a fashion-y person. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I was coming to it from, a, from like a place of craft. So it was a really interesting process because the fashion industry, you know, you having such incredible craftspeople with so much knowledge, but you have so many personalities where it's all about status Mm -hmm. and that are really toxic. And I had to navigate all of that just to do the work I wanted to do. And so all of those early experiences, very few of them were like with nice people. You know, I, I, my, at that point, my mentor experience was about finding people who were doing incredible work and who would allow me to basically like be a slave for them. Like that was really that early mentor experience. And it was only because I had this very healthy, you know, kind of beautiful, yeah. thoughtful parent parenting experience and with B and my mentor when I was growing up that I could kind of like weather through that level yeah. of intensity and still yeah. remain intact. Um, so, so working for, you know, I working for Dolce Gabbana, working for Alexander McQueen, there were opportunities that I got and I just chased. And I, I I would work 20 hour days in Alexander McQueen's studio, you know? And everyone else was doing cocaine and whatever, and I was not doing cocaine, but I was just working really hard and really, really cared about it. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so I think a lot of those early experiences were really conflicted for me because I was, mm-hmm. I was loving the work, but I wasn't loving the culture. And that mm-hmm. really led me down kind of the, the next set of paths to end up figuring out how to balance those different, those different. Yeah. Yeah. I really resonate with that. Loving the work, but not loving the culture, you know, and trying to find that fit, you know, but, but getting what you can out of what you're doing there. Um, you know, uh, how you kind of, uh, I want to, I want to ask you about that as well. Like, you know, starting out in music because you've kind of always been in music, mm-hmm. always. I mean, it's like you went to school for music. And then you went right into the service and um, you were a DJ and stuff like that. Um, how, is that how was that for you getting started? Um, I had a lot of trouble in school. Uh, just um, I had to wear glasses in first grade. So because uh, I had a terrible astigmatism, <laughs> um, which now after I had my cataracts fixed, I don't have anymore. I don't really need to wear my glasses, but I do because of the mm. fashion. These are old old, old Ralph Lauren glasses. Anyway, so, um, <laughs> Perfect. yeah, Perfect. so, uh, I, uh, played the trumpet and, uh, in, in elementary school. And then, um, I found a piano and, uh, my parents bought it for me and it went into my bedroom in our home and actually went into the basement of our first, our first home. And, uh, my father came home with a little transistor radio that he got for opening bank accounts from me and my sister. And I used to put, I used to steal my sister's radio and put them up on either side of the piano. And I would play along with the rock and roll of the fifties. Nice. So, you know, Fats Domino and the Everly brothers and, you know, that kind of uh, buddy Holly and uh, James Brown. And I could play all that stuff but I taught myself how to do it. And then I took real piano lessons, which I sucked at. Um, Elementary school, uh, junior high school, uh, I took the music test and um, I scored very high because I have perfect pitch. So it's not the best of things to have. And anyway, uh, my music teacher needed a person to play the timpani because the timpani has to be tuned. So I said, oh, that's cool. Anything to get a little, you know, applause. Uh, I didn't get anything at home like that. So I uh, played the timpani and I got tired of going boom, 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 boom. So in the middle of the, my in the middle of seventh grade, I said to the, to the music teacher, um, I want to play something that plays a melody. Boom, 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 ain't it. And I didn't want to be in the marching band. Mm. So he <laughs> said, well, uh, I have a bassoon that you could play. And I went, what's a bassoon? And so anyway, he took out this thing and he said to me, if you play the bassoon, you can get into any college in America and not pay tuition. 
you'll go for free because every school needs a bassoon player. So <laughs> my dad, wants to be one. <laughs> you know, yeah, no, well, it was, it was something that everybody needed and, but they, nobody wanted to play it because it was really ugly and it weighed 30 pounds. <laughs> and so um, I said, okay. And I brought it home and my father screamed at me, what the hell is that? My father loved classical music and he was a Broadway show guy. My father was an accountant. My mother was an artist. She, um, she was, uh, uh, she colored in black and white pictures to make them look like color pictures. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so from the bassoon, I got really good at it and I won all kinds of awards and I got scholarships to every school in America, including West Point. And I chose the Eastman School of Music, went to music school. So I was the best bassoon player in high school in 1963 um, nationwide. I won all kinds of awards. <clears throat> when I got to Eastman, I was number 11. And I went, where were you guys? And they said, well, our school didn't, wouldn't pay for us to be in anything. And all of a sudden I went, uh-oh. And I had to really play hard, hard, because it really came natural, naturally to me. Mm -hmm. And I loved doing it. And I played with the Buffalo Philharmonic and under Lucas Foss and very famous conductors. And I took lessons. I took the train to New York City and I took lessons from the first bassoonist to the New York Philharmonic, Manny Ziegler. And I just got really good at it. And it was, and it was, it was fun. And then, mm -hmm. um, uh, so uh, Eastman was f uh, good, good for a while. And then uh, I wasn't taking so many classes and uh, I got drafted. And it was during the Vietnam War. And they said, oh, look what you did. And, you know, I was working as a disc jockey at a radio station to fill in. I was playing bass in a group, um, uh, a folk group. And uh, so I became a disc jockey for Armed Forces Radio. And I lived in Berlin. Uh, they sent me say. to Berlin. And, and I lived behind cool. the Iron Curtain. But I recorded everybody. Oscar Peterson, Count Basie, Duke Ellington. Anybody, the Bee Gees, Proko Haram, but I recorded them to interview them. So, um, and I would do all these interviews of these famous musicians and did radio shows for the radio station. And I had, I was a terrible interviewer and I learned how to edit my interviews. So I sounded smart. And that's how I got into that part of the recording studio business, starting as an editor. And then, Wow. And then we'll get to, to the other stuff later, we'll, I guess. But we'll get, we'll get that was to, a start. But yeah. I got fired from every job I ever had. Every job I ever had. I <laughs> never could quit. I would go into quit and they said, oh, by the way, Howie, you're fired. Why? <laughs> Why? Why were they Because I always, I, I would say, that, that guy's an asshole that, <laughs> no, that, owned, that owned the place. And I would, I would take as much as I could from him or her and... Uh, it was just, uh, it was just not in me to be an employee, Yeah. but I had yeah. a lot of jobs and I always, I always screw, you know, what is it? I F'd up. I mm -hmm. always got a better job the next time and the next time, but I, you know, probably 40, 50 jobs. Wow. And so that's, uh, I that's, had be going. that's before you started your own. Yep. Uh, somebody <laughs> leaned over. So wow. It was the entrepreneurial thing. Somebody, leaned, you're really good. How you should open your own place. No. Yeah. Whoa. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, there's a whole ton of rock and roll and, and you know, records and mm -hmm. <laughs> famous people that I recorded and worked with and TV shows and movies and stuff before I opened my own place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there was a, I opened with one studio. Uh, the receptionist was my at the time wife. And um, we, opened in the gray bar building above grand central station. Cause I lived in a basement apartment in Scarsdale. <laughs> it was just like saying a basement apartment in Beverly Hills mm -hmm. it was uh, really stupid. And um, I would take the train in every day. And I had four jobs before that guy said, Hey, so in 1975, I opened my own studio. I took my bar mitzvah money and parlayed it into it. about 50 grand. And in 1975, 50 grand was a lot of money, but I built a little studio and I copied all the studios that I worked for in LA and just brought the LA vibe to mm. New York City. I was the first person to do that. So, so you guys both had kind of um, like Karuna, you had an early mentor 
like somebody who was right there early on and showed you something you didn't even know you really liked, but then you, you loved it and she was right there for you. Yeah. Um, and then, and how your, your background is, you know, you're, you're getting fired <laughs> from everything, <laughs> but you yeah. know, but trying all these, but you, but you know, you're good at music. You guys, it's like, you both know you're, you're good at something and you love, you love something and you're good at it. It's kind of and, a Howard Stern story. You know, Howard Stern um, became a disc jockey because his father would always yell at him um, to shut up when he was in the back seat because he was mm -hmm. listening to the radio in the car. They would drive around so his father could listen to the radio in the car. And I knew his father. His father owned a recording studio in, in New York City. Ben Stern was his name. And um, Howard was a, a messenger that also sold drugs when he came to the other studios. It was called, what was it called? Uh, I for, a median? No, I forget the name of the studio, but Anyway, um, Howard Stern became a disc jockey so that he could have his father listen to him to try and get the from his dad. I never got this at home, so that's why I wanted to be on stage, and that's why I went into music. Business. Yeah. How about you, Karuna? Did you get much of that at home? I, I was just really lucky to be born to two very nice people who really liked each other. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm very aware of how rare that is. <laughs> it's like you know, an incredible yeah. gift that was given to me. Um, but, but I think for a long time, my parents were just very confused about what I was doing and, and what I consider lucky. And I, I'm very grateful to them for is that they just stayed out of my way. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, I had like a tough conversation at 17. That was like, where are you? We haven't seen you for three days. That's not okay. <laughs> This is before cell phones, you know, and I was fine. I was fine. I was getting good grades. I was just out doing stuff because there was a life to live, you know, yeah. and I had no fear. Yeah. And, and I look back and it terrifies me now with two kids of my own to think that they're going to be doing at 15, 16, what I was doing, but I actually okay. look back at it with so much, you know, pleasure. And it was, it was actually, I don't think there's anything really bad about anything I did. It wasn't all totally legal, but you know. <laughs> It was okay. Um, <laughs> Very <good> fun. <laughs> so, yeah, well, sometimes so I, sometimes I, you have I, a reverse um, mentor. Go ahead. A, go ahead. Yeah, go I ahead. didn't. I wasn't rebelling against mm -hmm. anything. I just was seeking. I was searching. I was just yeah. looking for more. And Chicago was a great place to grow up. And I grew up in the city. But but when I got to New York, man, I was like, oh, finally, because in New York. <laughs> yeah. Can I swear on this show, Michelle? I meant yeah, to ask you absolutely, that. absolutely. Because in New York, nobody gives a fuck about who you are. You can just mm -hmm. do, you know. And in, even in Chicago, it's a little bit like, well, what is she doing over there? You know, what? Yeah. What, you know, who she thinks she is, or like, why is she doing something different? And in yeah. New York, it was not only like, could you be whoever you wanted to be or try it out, but there's always somebody better than you, and mm -hmm. and that felt very yeah. comfortable to me. I was always looking for like. What's the next step? Not from a status perspective, but from like a growth perspective, a learning perspective. Yeah. And I think yeah. just coming back to our subject tonight, like that's, that's part of why I'm passionate about mentoring, not because mm -hmm. I have an idea about something I should be doing, but because like that feeling is such a good feeling, that feeling of growth. And I'm so grateful to the people who actually stopped to help me along the way. Right. That like, I get a lot of joy just from doing the same back. You know, and that, that kind of energy, that kind of reciprocity to me is like a very precious commodity. Yeah. It's the passion. I mean, both of you really are coming into a place of like having a lot of passion, you know, and anybody like, I, I know some other people that like how you get fired over and over again until they finally just started their own thing. And that was always out of passion, you know, and I remember that uh, I'll share a quick thing about me is like, I, I did have a really wonderful mentor and, um, but later in life, not until my thirties and whatnot, but when I had her around, I had a lot of wonderful, like she saw things in me and gave me a lot of opportunities and I went after them. But when she left, all the things that she said I was good at, my next boss said I had a problem with, mm. you know? And so it was really, I realized I already had such a, a strong, um, um, you know, support in, in, in seeing that I was good at these things. And then to have somebody else come in and say that I wasn't was first confusing, but then I realized, no, this is just perspective. These are just different yeah. people. And I, and I can choose which one I want to believe. Yeah. yeah I don't think so. there's an objective reality in that. I mean, listen, right. if right. you want to be a world-class gymnast, you might have some limitations physically, you know, it's not just like the, the passion's not necessarily going to get you there, right. but 
But when it comes to a lot of other things, I, I do think you got to find the people that are meeting you where you need to be met and the people that you know, have something to give you at that point that you need it. And just being attuned to that and recognizing that whether you're the giver or the taker is half the battle. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to talk about that next too. It's like, um, because both of you, like, I want to move into these next pieces of, you know, your next roles uh, that include leadership and whatnot. You know, Karuna, you moved into more leadership roles in different types of brands that might have been more aligned with what you're doing and how we, uh, you know, started, you started your own recording in there. So I want to talk a little bit about that um, and, and, you know, see how that was for you to move into those places but- and be on the other side. Let me just interject one one thing when when she was talking about uh, when Karuna was talking about having a mentor and when coming to New York, you had all these people that were you could look at and say, oh, and compare yourself to one of the things that I always did is I found somebody that was really great. And I said, wow. And and I would judge them and say, "Mm." and if I really liked them, I would copy them. (laughs) <laughs> and I did that for my whole mm-hmm. life. If some guy was really successful, um, and, you know, or made a great record, I would listen and then say, oh man, that's fantastic bass. And the kick drum is unbelievable. And I would copy what he did. And uh, all of a sudden my stuff started to sound good too. And this guy did this with his studio and this with that studio. And I said, oh, that guy's doing a really great, I'm going to follow what he did. Uh, or you know, it's like when you have your own business is how do you hire people? Well, I just stole them. I found the good, the best people that work for everybody else and I hired them yeah. away. So it was, <laughs> that was so, and I had a, I had a young a mentor when I was very young, um, who was one of my music teachers. And then I got um, a mentor who actually was a, an equipment supplier, who was my mentor for 35 years. Mm-hmm. Wow. Nice. You, you were finding mentors, you were just finding them and making people your mentors, whether they knew it or not. So, yes. Well, that's, yeah. that's what I, you don't really realize. I mean, I didn't know that he had a name. <laughs> the, the mentor didn't exist when I was yeah. starting yeah. out in business. I mean, I mean, it's right. somebody wrote about it, but it certainly didn't make it to the front page of the New York Times, which is what I read every morning on the way to work. Well, I want to also, uh, I, I just had a hit on something when you wrote, both were talking about um, a place as a mentor, like New York City is yeah. a place, like LA was a place, people go there and it's like the whole city is just a big, you know, you know, hotbed of, of things to, to learn from and to get advice from. So um, I hadn't that's thought great. about that before. Yeah, I think that's a great point. When I moved to Italy, it all, that also changed my life and my whole perspective and just being part of that culture and connecting mm-hmm. with people you know, even on the weekends or going to their house or for dinner, it's like, you know, it was being kind of um, immersed in a culture where everybody, regardless of their, their actual, um, their actual job was very interested in clothing Mm -hmm. and very particular about it. And in fact, like the best version of everything. And, you know, really, it was just such a different culture from the US. And, and that, that definitely changed my perspective. Um, But but I think one of the things that you're reminding me of, Howie, is that I don't, I don't think I actually had a, an official mentor where that person was like intentionally being a mentor or acknowledged that until I was already an executive. Like the majority of people, once I started working in more corporate environments, which I kind of accident, kind of fell into mm-hmm. accidentally because I was broke. You got kicked upstairs. <laughs> yeah, I got, I, I was like working on my own line, working freelance, mm-hmm. trying to like do, you know, really cool, innovative stuff and suffering. And I got this job dropped in my lap at Abercrombie mm-hmm. and uh, they're starting a new brand called Rule, which was supposed to be like when you graduate Abercrombie. And I didn't necessarily have the best association with the brand at that point. I was not a big fan of Abercrombie. It wasn't cool to me. Mm-hmm. They're starting a brand that was inspired by this family in New York that were leather artisans and little, yeah. and, uh, and they were like, here's a pile of money. We're going to fly you out here, give you all this stuff. Oh, and by the way, in the first year, like they didn't tell me this at the time, but what happened was I was in Hong Kong staying in four star hotels for like 10 weeks out of the year, working with the factories. Like I couldn't have been happier. So all of a sudden I ended up taking this corporate job, but I didn't like the people. I didn't like the culture any more than I liked high fashion culture, truthfully, Mm -hmm. but I learned so much. And 
And the people that I learned from, I learned from the fit models. I learned from the technicians. I learned from the wash specialist. I learned from the guy who ran the embroidery machine. Mm -hmm. You know, those were my people. Those were the yeah. people that I would just kind of clamp onto. But none of those, none of those people were like giving me official mentoring sessions. <laughs> right. They're teaching me how to use a machine, telling me about mm -hmm. their past. They were so much more interesting yeah. than the people who were actually in charge. Mm -hmm. And now that mm -hmm. I'm in charge, I feel kind of bad saying that because it's not that nice. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, but that's how I felt. And those are the people I gravitated towards. Yeah. One of the things that was in, in my end was that I really didn't like my clients um, <laughs> because they couldn't ever make up their minds and they were just a pain in the ass. And I would turn around and say, who wrote this shit? And it was just, you know, because I would get a script and I'm looking at it and going, oh, I have to record this. This is, this. And it was the client's wife wrote the script. and I'm going, oh, my God, I'm going to get fired again. But I really wanted to be on the other side of the glass always. I wasn't good enough to be in the studio playing. Mm. So I built a studio so that I could have a place. I, I wanted to be Ed Sullivan. Ed Sullivan was on mm. television for 30 years. And every week he said, and here is, he had no talent. He was a writer for, you know, a goofy writer for a New York newspaper. And he, you know, the Ed Sullivan theater, that's a, he yeah. really, they built it for him anyway. Right. And he would always say, and here is, and here is, and people would come and go, you know, it was this guy and that guy, and he had the Beatles on and so on and so forth. He didn't discover them. They just kind of were on there. Right. And I wanted to be kind of like that, where I was always around and I wanted to be, have longevity as opposed to the guys that I recorded who came three months, we made a record. It was out for two years and they disappeared or they killed themselves or they, you know, yeah. you know, they, they worked at music stores or something like that. Yeah. But I, 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 I had, that was the longevity that I got was from being a place that everybody wanted to come to. I was in the services business. Yeah. You know, yeah. attitude was what, you know, mm. Bob Smith, Bob Smith is, is talking <laughs> one of our friends. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, introducing me to him he's commenting sure. and he's hysterical <laughs> in the chat so anyway i think he might be on this episode too because <laughs> well, he's definitely you, i think you've met him yeah, yeah yeah oh yeah he's definitely there so oh my god i want i know i want to ask you guys some questions uh some more about all of this we're already at 6.35. What I want to do is break off really quick into a poll. Uh, we've got a poll here, and I did it a little different than we often do because I did a lot of multiple choice. I wanted to see kind of just people's take. There's no right or wrong answer, um, and we don't get to take the poll. All the uh, participants get to take the poll, but we can talk about it. So uh, I, I want to hear from Howie and Karuna. What, uh, what are some of your feelings about some of these? What is the role of the mentor? Do you want me to answer this or are you letting Well, we're, we're going to talk more about, especially this particular one, but like, if you were to answer even multiple choice, but one answer for one of these, what would you say? Uh, oh. This is the closest to guide. Yeah. I, I was going to pick the same one. Yeah. If, mm -hmm. if you can't let you're smarter than them. Usually um, <laughs> um, they can't be your manager or your boss because they can fire you. Uh, and it, Later. we're gonna we're gonna talk about that uh, <laughs> we're gonna talk wait, no that's okay you can bring it up i love that i love that that's what i want to do is kind of take a temperature here okay uh, then that, what are the three most important qualities of a good mentor to you you know and can, these I might can. be all but what are your you top scroll ones up, howie what um, you gotta you scroll gotta scroll up. oh lots well, of experience I, that's my number one like real experience mm -hmm. I'd say inspirational, motivational would be my number two. And yeah, probably the others, good listener. The, others, number three. Yeah. Good listener. the good listener part is, uh, well, the good listener and lots of experience. Um, if you're a good listener, you have lots of experience, or if you have lots of experience, you learn how to be a good listener. You know, if you put is <laughs> the inspirational, <laughs> motivational, absolutely not. That doesn't do it. And <laughs> I think that's important. I think that's important. Oh, oh I'm sorry. No, it <laughs> gives me feedback. My, my my mentor always said to me, you got too many balls in the air. You got to pick one. 
Mm -hmm. because I always had a thousand things going on. I was going to open this kind of company and put this division in and <laughs> hire this person and build another studio. And uh. Okay, so then on the other side, what are the three most important qualities of a good mentee? Flip it around. Attitude. Accountability, attitude. Yeah, it's, oh, not, it's not even on there. I'm here. <laughs> I, 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 would, I would have said um, like that they work hard. Like I'm... For somebody, for me to give somebody my time, I expect them to put the time in themselves, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, yep. Well, I, you need to interview um, as a mentor, you have to interview the mentee and make sure that they're worth your time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even if they're paying mm -hmm. you, sometimes yeah, it's just absolutely. not worth it. They don't get it. And they're just, you know, they have money or they have time. Yeah. And they, 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 you, it's somebody's son or daughter, no offense. Um, that's, they want you to, could you help my son out? I mean, how many resumes did I read in the 40 years that I was in business? 20,000. How many kids did I interview? I have a really big record collection. Do you play an instrument? Do you know, can you read music? Can you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah. And the guy well, said, well, I don't like what my dad does. I said, what did he do? He says, he buys expired food. And he and the, I know his father he drives a Ferrari. They have a gigantic house, belongs to two <laughs> country clubs, a house in Florida. I said, I'll take your job. You can have mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, what does a successful mentorship look like to you? Um, yeah. This is well, the last one here. No, I was thinking about this in, before, the, before when I was thinking about B. Harris, about my home mm -hmm. ec my home ec teacher. Um, I actually think like the most magical relationships do have a lot of chemistry mm -hmm. and that's not required. And it's not something you can necessarily control. I don't think you can, I don't, that's not to say you can't have a good mentor mentee relationship without chemistry, but right. it's really amazing when you've got it because yeah. it goes so much deeper. And those are usually lifelong relationships that you build. Yeah. Um, so that's like the most exciting ones, you know, yeah. to me. Well, um, let's see. Um, we still have, we only have uh, about half of our audience has voted. You guys need more time. We can't vote, right? No, we can't no. vote. We can't, we can't vote. vote. Um, oh, okay. Why don't we give it? Yeah, why don't, we're going to cut it off. We've got 10 more seconds, guys, audience to, uh, to vote on these. I Maurizio, know, I, vote. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, we're going to end it. Let's go see what people did. So Karen's going to end it and show us the answers here, if you can see. All right. So yeah, most people said guide. Yeah. Now, all of these, it's interesting because, uh, and I will get into this. I don't want to talk too much about number one, because we're going to move right into this uh, in a minute. So, but yeah, guide, guide was, uh, yeah, I expected that to be the highest one, but we'll talk about the others as well. Confidant friend there's some things in there. Boss. <laughs> Somebody said, what? Nobody, they're Nobody very said clear. Boss. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's really great to actually see so okay what are the three most important qualities of a good mentor to you and inspiration and motivational was really important to a lot of people it doesn't mean it, it it's like different things are important to different people and different relationships are going to be there but um that was uh, number one lots of experience gives feedback um, good listener was, uh, okay. Yeah. What are the three most important qualities of a good, uh, mentee accountability and takes responsibility. Now I kind of see that a bit as the, um, working hard piece. Um, when in my research about mentor mentoring, I've always seen, it's like, it's the, the mentee does the work, you know, they are the ones who bring everything to the table and, um, run, run that process. So they're not, if they're not like coming to class and being waited, waiting to be told what to do. Um, and what does a successful mentorship look like? High levels of trust and respect yeah. um, and strong communication and connection, which I think is also a, along the, uh, the chemistry roles. And then the clearly defined relationship goals. Um, so with that, I want to go back to the first one now, which is what is the role of a mentor? And I want to hear from each of you, you know, what you think is the role of a mentor and how that's different. Because I, I had a lot of experiences when I first started where people were like, well, you're my manager, so you're, you're supposed to mentor me, right? Or like, so a lot of people would kind of be that. And I knew very clearly somehow that they were not the same. Um, but yeah, will you talk about that? Like, what is a mentor and what is mentor not? Now, Karuna, why don't we start with you? 
Yeah, I think one of the ways that I would characterize a good mentor, somebody who basically provides valuable insight. And I use that word because, you know, the people that I ended up following or that I kind of forced to be my mentors, whether they, we never agreed to that officially until much later, right? Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. um, I, they would just say things where I was like, that's true. And I've never thought about it, or that's the answer or, oh, that's how you do it. You know, so it was like this really tangible, whether it was philosophical or like a, a, a physical act or how you use a software or how you use a machine. Um, it was like, oh, that's what, that's how you do it. Mm -hmm. And the most amazing people were the people who could do really difficult, abstract things that way. So like, you know, my boss, when I was working for American Eagle, um, this guy, Charles Martin, he, he was a real character and very, very difficult to get mm -hmm. along with. Mm -hmm. But when he sat down and worked a color palette, and this sounds like kind of a stupid thing, okay, but when he worked a color palette, he, I would come to him and I'd say, these are the colors for the season. And he'd be like, Karuna, this is totally wrong. He would move it all around <laughs> and he'd be like, you need to do this, you need to do that. And, it, and it, the words didn't matter at all, but he, what he did looked way more beautiful than what I had come to him with. Yeah. And just the fact that he could do that I just, I watched him and I, and he didn't know how to tell me how he did it, but mm -hmm. I figured it out just by watching. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that was a very tangible insight in something that I never could have learned in a class. Nobody's going to say, this is how you work color. And this is your formula. And this is your system. It was like an intuitive thing that he had figured out how to do over, you know, 20, 30 years. Yeah. And then for other people, they had really worked hard to become experts in a specific field and they knew how to articulate that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think no matter the thing that the commonality is insight that like I would gain a valuable insight, whether that was something that was explicit or not or not explicit, I would kind of just know in my gut. Mm -hmm. It's the same feeling that you get when you're having an experience that's changing you, yeah. you know? So like part of insight to me is that you change when you're, when you're out on the other side of it. Like mm -hmm. it actually changes your brain. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. sometimes that's like just beauty, experiencing beauty, yeah. you know, and that's why like a place is an interesting concept about, about mentorship, but. And you're speaking very clearly on how mentorship really is about taking that accountability and doing the work yourself. You're looking for yeah. it. You're trying yeah. to do it. So you're looking yeah. for the mentors too. Yeah. You know, or I'm coming up against something like in a project or at a point and there's a person who's unlocking that for me. Yeah. Right. Um, right. And, and yeah, and that, it just feels in that moment, like the most valuable thing I could ever get from yeah. anybody. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Howie? What, what is mentoring? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I, I feel, you know, I, I see a lot of people talking about the place and um, I created an atmosphere of competition as well as camaraderie so that um, people could learn from the, from, not from me, but from everybody else that worked there as well. Take a piece of this person and a piece of that person. And then this guy was really good on keyboards, you know, recording keyboards. And this guy was really good for doing full orchestras. And this guy, or this girl or girl, or, you know, this one was a good right. editor. and so, so that everybody could learn from each other and they could compete and grow. Because that was the most important thing for me with my employees was growing. I didn't want to be their mentors. I was kind of their leader. And, mm -hmm. and my lines to them were, what do you think you should do? Mm -hmm. you, when you ask me, a question, well, what do you think you should do? Learn, use your brain. Tell me what you do. Write it down on a piece of paper and bring it back to me. And let's talk about it as opposed to, it's called the, the, the One Minute Manager Meets the Monkey. We talked about this before. It's a book. Right. And you can read about it where somebody stands in your doorway and says, Howie, uh, uh, what do you, I, I got a problem with so on and so forth. So, hmm, let, tell me about it. And I listen, I listen, and all of a sudden the monkey's got one foot on my shoulder. And I said, and then I would say, let me think about it. And that monkey just jumped on my back and I got a, and the, and the, the employee goes off and is having a good time because he got it off his or her chest. So I, I don't yeah. know, a, a mentor was, is somebody outside of your world yeah. that has experience doing stuff. It's like, you know, uh, Michelle, when you and I had that meeting, it, it, because it's all, the, it's every business is the same. It's, it's about the, the personal relationships that we talked about. And it was, yeah. you know, how you treat this person and how do you do this? And, you know, the, and, 
Yeah. You know, it's like my to do list is always the first five things on my to do list is me, 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 me. Because if you don't take care of yourself, nobody else is going to. When you're in the in the yeah. stratosphere where we were, or whatever you want to call it, everybody's wants to be taken care of and mm. nobody's taking care of you. Yeah. So you have to take care of yourself. And, and that was what, that was one of my mentors. He said, come on, you got to take care of yourself because you're taking care of everybody else. And that's not your job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're bringing up something really important that that's like, it been an interesting dynamic for me because, you know, I have two children at home. Mm -hmm. I'm generally an empathic person, but people misconstrue my niceness for like, uh, you know, being motherly, which I am actually not at all, especially <laughs> at work. <laughs> like I have no interest in being anybody's mother at, at all, except for my kids. And I do it because I love them so much. And that's pretty much it. You know, yeah. like being somebody's mother was never like part of the thing I wanted to do. And, yeah. um, and, and so when I, even when I'm working with my team and I'm actively mentoring a person on my team, which is a choice I make, that's not just a given right? Mm. That's a different relationship between, I think it is between manager right. and mentor. Um, I'm, 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 I'm doing it because I need to get more out of them because I want to get over there and we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. So even then, even when I'm, when I, what I, what it looks like is that I'm giving and giving and giving it's because there's a vision that I'm trying to get to. And this person is a crucial part of that vision. Mm -hmm. And ultimately if that person can't get there with me, the person's not going to stay on my team. Mm -hmm. But if that person works hard, we will get there together. No question. And if they're willing to put the work in, you know, we're going to find a way I have no doubt about it. And that, that's a huge, that's a huge distinction to me because as right. a, as a mentor, you know, especially in a professional environment, I'm not like doing it out of the kindness of my heart. I'm doing it because there's something to be gotten there either mm -hmm. in our relationship for both of us. If it's, if we're on the same team. Or if it's because they're really genuinely searching for something and I have a key to help them unlock it. Mm -hmm. That right. feels worthwhile to me. Yeah. And that leads me to like wanting to uh, talk about very specifically, what is that difference between mentoring and managing? Um, because I, I was, I was, as I was researching, I mean, I, I've looked into this over the years as well, but I was kind of going back to my research and, and seeing like, well, in managing, you know, we're, we're trying to move people towards a goal that we have and a goal we have for the for the company right and in the mentoring you're 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 moving somebody towards you know their goals right so there's all these things written about both of it i want to hear your takes on uh <laughs> on that yeah, yeah I, I, that's an eye roll for me i don't like <laughs> I don't, you know oh god yeah. um should i go first yes please. Yeah, yeah, go for it okay. <laughs> um mentoring and managing are they're not even close it's not my job to take care of you mentoring is being a sounding board being uh trying to help you steer around that hairpin curve that you're about to do when you're am i changing jobs am i doing this am i doing that it's 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 mentoring is listening and just making sure that you don't go off the rails because th that's, you know, it's like going to the shrink. What do you go to the shrink for? To dump on somebody so that you don't screw up a relationship. And a mentor is the same situation. You can't, when you own a company or you're the boss, uh, whether, you know, even in your division, you can't ask the people below you and trust that they're going to give you an unsolicited, an unbiased answer because everybody that works for you has an ulterior motive that's not the same as yours. Because mm. you did it too. Don't forget, we were all, <laughs> we were employees at one time and I learned how to read upside down because I would go into my boss's office and I'd look down at his desk and go, oh, oh. Uh, that's a big check that you're writing to blah, blah, blah. How come <laughs> I don't get checks like that? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a, it was just. <clears throat> All right. Just, so I don't disagree with you, Howie, but I do have a slightly different perspective because okay. I'm a manager of 75 people technically at this moment, okay. uh -huh. um, which is this. I think when you're a manager, your, your first, your first loyalty is still to you, to the company. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, literally your job. And it doesn't mean you can't mentor in that context, but the mentorship is a little bit, is limited by that. And as long as I think that's honest and explicit, you can be authentic about it. You know, you're not pretending it's anything okay. else, right? When your name's on the door, it's a little different though. So yeah. what happens yeah, is, that's, is a, that's true. I was, nobody I was is your friend. You, I was, I was, was going to bring that up because I've been in, you know, I'm not, not quite at the same level as Karuna, but I've been in that role too, where you just, you know, like I have a job that I've been hired by the company to do. And mm-hmm. I need my team to do it. But when your name's on the door and you are the company, that's it is a different situation. Yeah. 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 Who am I going to ask? That's why I had a mentor because right. I got nobody to talk to. Yeah. You, but- you want to call your accountant? Your accountant is an accountant because he, he right. was not an entrepreneur like you. But- there is something too about it, the word confidant came up again. It's like, you know, uh, a mentor is somebody that there is a bit of a confidence that can happen there. That is not the same. It with better a, be right with it. It's not the same as a management and manager and manager. No, and I think, I mean, I think ultimately you have kind of the most robust type of mentorship when you have that, that distance, mm-hmm. when there isn't some kind of financial relationship binding you, that's not, you know, I right. mean, if it's a therapist or it's a service you're paying for, then that's super clear, but you get kind of the full range of what mentorship can be. Yeah. But, but that doesn't mean, but there, you know, I still, I still engage in, in mentorship with multiple people on my team. And that's happened because either they've asked for it or I've seen that they're ready for something and I need to give them special time and attention yeah. because yep. I need potential. And I make that very explicit and we really focus on that thing. And it's a wonderful experience, you know, mm-hmm. it's, yep. really, it's really growthful. It really builds that loyalty. And, and the one thing I bring with it is that even if I have to consider, you know, the, 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 the bottom line or the company or whatever, you don't have to be shady about it. <laughs> I'm very right. on it and I'll be very direct about it. There's no, I'm not going to say one thing to you and then say another behind your back. And I, and I think there's a lot of that activity in, in corporate America. So we have this really negative association with the idea of a manager that they're duplicitous or that they're inauthentic, mm-hmm. but I've worked really hard to try to play that role in with integrity. Yeah. And so sometimes I, I won't be able to share something with somebody. And I say, you know, I'm not, not able to share that with you. Right. And I'll right. say that to them because yeah, then, but that's, I, that's so hard to back off from that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. you want to tell them, but you can't. Yeah. No. And I have to work so hard to figure out how to say that right in a way right. that I felt uh, like didn't make know. me an asshole. You know? Right. Right. I've been in that experience with my mentor when I was younger as well, because she happened to be my boss and she wasn't a mentor to everybody that she managed. She managed a large team as well. Um, but she was very clearly a mentor to me. And there were things that she would say, I, I can't talk about that piece, but she was there to really help me. But I stood up, you know, I, I had to get, I step up to the plate. Right. right. Um, I was going to say, um, yeah, I, we had a comment in here in the, in the chat it says, isn't mentoring really equipping, which mm-hmm. is something I hadn't heard is, is equipping, equipping people with skills, tools, information. Karuna's nodding and how he's rolling is. <laughs> yeah. Well, what happens is, is mentoring is telling you where the rocks are. So you can walk across. It looks like you're walking on water, but the rocks are really there and you should oh, that's be. That's a good to, one. I like that. Yeah. Um, because mentoring, I, I, I don't, the only skills that I try to pass on are people skills, like how to decide if somebody really is good enough to work for you or um, should you, you know, a lot of times the mentoring is um, I want to hire this person, blah, 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 blah. And we have to, go, it's an HR situation and it, uh, and it's all, okay, well, uh, but this is what might happen because they don't come with enough of this stuff. You know, it's like, I, I had a, friend that only hired uh, people that had been in the the hospitality business Mm -hmm. because he could teach them all the skills, but the skill, the hospitality skill, you can't learn that. Mm -hmm. You, you, you have to have some of it inside. There are a lot of people that don't have the ability to say, can I get something for you? Can I help? They're not, you know, it's just, it, it, it's just an right. experience. I worked at a McDonald's. I worked at Pat's hot dog stand. I totally got that. And it was awful and great at the same time. Cause I learned so much about people. Yeah, um, yeah. And right. you know, it's, it's, I can't, I can't hire all the time skills. I need to hire attitude. If somebody has got a great attitude, I'm going to keep that person. I, I it's just, I'll teach them because it's just, 
you it's so hard to find somebody with the attitude just like you and michelle you and i had this conversation uh, uh when we when we talked about when i'm looking at somebody would i have lunch with this person right. it, 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 you know looking to hire somebody because but I want my to have team? lunch with them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to either I want to have lunch with my team is going to have to work with this person or they're a represent representative of me. Well, my clients like sitting in a room for three days, mm -hmm. mixing with somebody that's an asshole. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even though he's a great mixer, if he's an asshole, it's not going to happen. At well, some let's, point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's I mean, getting into that, then I want to talk about the 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 being a mentee, like getting mentored, um, yeah. because, you know, clearly it's like, we've all had those experiences of so many, if, if we, if we need it. People need that skill building and they're not going to get it from school. They're going to get it on the job, right there, or they're not going to get it. Um, but you know, I, uh, I think I was posting something, um, that, you know, anybody as a mentee, anybody who's been a mentee about 90, 97% of mentees, say they find a, a lot of value in it. Meaning they, that when they're a mentee, they really get a lot from it. You know, I posted a bunch of statistics about how it helps. Um, but 85% of employees in the workforce today don't have a mentor. Mm -hmm. And I, that was an experience I had in a lot of my colleagues. Most people would say, I, I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have a mentor to help me. I had to kind of blaze my own trail or learn this Not myself. everybody knows they need one. Not or, every, or, or, and or, there's a lot know, of people that don't need them. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just uh, workers. But yeah, yeah. And I wanted to say, like, what, what are some of the barriers? Why don't people pursue finding a mentor or looking or, or noticing that they might have had one that they don't realize they had? Um, but, you know, that 85% of people who don't have them, I don't know, that's, that's, you know, it's a pretty gray area to say, because with all the experiences you guys are saying. Um, I mean, Fundamentally, I think there's like a baseline human reality here, which is that humans learn through relationships and communication and mm -hmm. that it's the same thing for a lot of people who never do therapy and then do therapy and didn't grow up in an environment where like people that was very healthy, which is most people, right? Right. 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 So I right. think it, there, it's a similarly difficult for people to, to engage into a health in a healthy mentor mentee relationship because they just don't have any model for it. Right. You know? right. So first of all, how do you break that threshold? You have right. to and most people don't, they can't yeah. even look at it at home. Right. You know, you think that, okay, there, this is bricks and mortar at home. And <laughs> mine was, I, everything my dad did, I did the opposite of. Because, <laughs> because I, I it's, it's just, oh, yeah. dad, you're such an asshole. That seems he to be was a successful case. asshole, but it's. <laughs> It's like we either do what our families condition us to do in some form and, uh, and another way we do the, exactly the opposite. You know, we always have this <laughs> kind of push pull, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, if we grew up with parents or families that did those sorts of things, we are more likely to take that into our lives Get and that, out, recognize it. Yeah. Yeah. But we don't. Um, but but that wasn't something that was very big. Um, across a lot of job cultures, you know, when we were kids and, and younger and whatnot, uh, there might have been, I think uh, that was one of the things I also kind of brought up in here was apprenticing. And I think that that's been a model for some uh, types of jobs. And I think a lot of men in the workforce eons ago would always kind of be apprenticed and kind of move up and whatnot um, in general. And so that's, that's a little bit of a mentorship as well. Um, but our workforce has been changing so much in the last 30, 40 years. Um, and, and the other thing I noticed was I, I found that, and I didn't find statistics for it, but I found that there were a lot of women really a lot keyed into or towards the mentoring, looking yeah. for a mentor. Um, but, I, but I think that's also because, you know, I do think it's more culturally acceptable for women to have those kinds of relationships from day one, whereas like culturally you have a lot of male relationships that are bred through competition. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, they form in these different ways just because of social norms. And even when I was in college, you know, one of the professors who was a real mentor to me, who's a big character, he, um, I remember him telling me, you know, students, you're like an old school student. Students aren't like you anymore. They think they, they just get everything they pay for it. They don't have to work for it. They have no humility. They don't respect anybody. And I'm sure that's what people are saying about students now. Mm -hmm. now like in every generation, you have right. people who are willing to work for it, who recognize 
um, you know, the people who can teach them, who recognize guides, who recognize teachers. And those people may also be the people who totally def defy authority and don't follow anything. But if you're, if you're smart, it doesn't, you don't have to follow the rules, but you do have to find the people who can teach you and you've got to respect them and you've mm -hmm. got to pay right. And mm -hmm. I don't think that's actually changed in, you know, in all of the generational changes that have happened, mm -hmm. even the young people in, in that I'm working with now, you know, who are in, you know, under 25, is what I'm defining as young people. Um, there, there are people who work their, their butts off and are not afraid of hard work. And there are people who want everything done for them. And that's just like, I'm going to give my time to that person, not that person. I'm not even no. mad at anybody. That's just, it's just very simple, you right. know? And, right. and I, I don't think that's a different thing. I think that's always the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, there's a there's a lot of stuff going on in the chat that's 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 fabulous. I, you know, when I talked about the hospitality business, one person said that she was ashamed. I guess her name is her name is Rose. She it's worked in a in a Bars. she was ashamed of being uh, working at a at a, a a restaurant in the hospitality business, and that what I said was broke broke it away because. It, gave her an gave this person an experience. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you that you're saying is, is uh, God don't um, when you're <clears throat> when, when I was talking about finding somebody to copy them, mm -hmm. you know, if you find somebody that's really cool, and you know, and it's just, it's just, it's just you, you go watch. I mean, there was a guy that who, unfortunately, we were all friends with. His name is Al Schmidt. I listened to every record he ever mixed so that I could be like him. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. he was he was in his 90s. Did you realize that he was that mm -hmm. old? I didn't realize he was that old. I had yeah. been listening to his stuff forever and ever. There's a guy in in, in New Jersey who was named Rudy Van Gelder. He, he was a dentist who loved recording Miles Davis and Cannonball Adderley and all these famous people. And I listened to every record that he, that he made because I wanted to know, I wanted to see how he did that. Mm -hmm. And so he wasn't my mentor, but he was my mentor. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We call it kind of modeling. Like, yeah. you know, like okay, that's another word for it. Yeah, yeah. But, but well, like the, the, they're the mentor, but you're taking their, um, experience their their actions their behaviors and you're modeling yourself right but it's I, modeling it's modeling for the mentee the mentor is just living exactly yeah. exactly, living. exactly. Know, they're, they're just and that's like that's just kind of an unofficial dynamic yeah. um but i think ultimately a mentee is seeking it out whether they're whether the mentor is aware of being a mentor or not yeah. there's still a seeking that has to happen otherwise the, the relationship doesn't ever take form I wanted to be close yeah. to all the guys that owned the big studios. Um, and because uh, I would always thought of myself as a little guy in the recording studio business. And there was a guy by the name of Joe Tarzia who built studios called uh, Sigma Sound in Philadelphia. And it was, you know, the Commodores and, and Lionel Richie and Tower Power and all these fantastic records. And, and whenever I had, we started this organization called Spars and I loved it when we had meetings at all the other studios and I would sneak into the studios and look at what was happening on Fader 1, Fader 2, Fader 3, Fader 4. And that was the drums and that was the rhythm section. And I, and I was just, it was, it was before phones had cameras on them because I would have got and taken all the settings that they would have on the consoles because I thought that was so great. And I absolutely snuck into these places to, <laughs> to, to, to see that. And, you know, it was just people I looked up to and, yep. you know, they weren't necessarily my official mentor, but my mentor kind of said, see that guy over there. That's blah, blah, blah. <gasps> really? Oh my God. You know, and it's just, you know, it's like, it's watching Bill Evans hands and it's like yeah. watching, you know, Oscar Peterson going and it's like watching Dave Graw play the drums. I mean, yeah. oh my I mean, God. In a way, Howie, what you're saying is like the smartest thing you can do as a mentee is just to surround yourself by greatness and ruthlessly do that. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you put yourself in a state. What's the worst that can happen? Totally. So get out. No. Okay. One of the things that like comes up a lot, Michelle, and in, in conversations that I have with anybody in the industry is that is they're like, should I? I'm I'm so unhappy. What should I do? 
right? Should I change jobs? What do I do? (laughs) Do I, do I, is it, it's just going to be the same everywhere. What do I do? How do I get out of this feeling, the situation, you know? And, and, and I don't, I, I don't always have an answer for that, but what I will say is like, you keep looking for a situation where you can find somebody amazing to work with and for, and you put yourself in that situation. And if you haven't found it yet, just keep looking, keep your job, pay your bills, keep looking and get yourself there as quickly as possible. And don't ask too many questions. Just like trust that you think somebody's amazing, go work with them. Don't worry about, oh, does it pay more? Does it pay less? You know, it's 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 those incredible people that you want to work for and with that are going to change your life. And if you use that as that the, the kind of first bar of decision making, it's probably going to work out, even yeah. if you're struggling in other ways. Yeah, that's great advice. I think Howie would say, what? What do you think you should do? Yeah, that's it. Just, <laughs> because there's an element of though, there is that piece. I mean, I think what Karuna just said is that it's like find that that you you know, and those are the, that that advice has been given to me, and I've done that, you know, and it has worked. Um, but the other piece too is that when you're saying, um, what do you think you should do? It's saying you know, in there somewhere in there, you know what you want to do. You know, like trust what you think you should do. Uh, but but listen to yourself, and that's a piece of the work too. Go seek it out. My, my martial arts teacher would always say, um, s- define what you want. You know, say what you want, send it out to the universe so the universe knows what you want, but then go do the homework. Go do the work to make yeah, it. Yeah, and you gotta be willing to be uncomfortable. Like, yeah. that's the other thing. Like, you gotta, yeah. you gotta, it's not gonna just happen tomorrow because uh, you like made a mind right. map. You know what I mean? You gotta keep working on it every day. And it gets you gotta, creepy. And you don't know how long it's gonna take. You know, you just don't know. Yeah. So you just gotta like stay the course, stay the course, stay like focused, stay grounded, work hard. And then magically four things happen at once. And you're like, I'm, I'm on top of the world. And then the whole thing crashes down a year later and that will always happen. And you never know when, and it yes. doesn't change anything, you know? Yes. No. So you can't yeah. doubt, you can't doubt your path in those moments. You gotta just like keep going and keep following yeah. those, like those essential things that you know to be true. Yeah. Otherwise you're just kind of like confuse yourself and waste time, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and all the, the, your industry, the fashion industry, or in, even the manufacturing industry, there's some, there's an art to, to that too. Um, Absolutely. Measure twice, cut once, but yeah. <laughs> you know, those, all those old sayings um, mm-hmm. in, in, the, in, it just, it's, there's a lot of crash and burns and you learn from them. And this, you know, scar tissue is the strongest mm-hmm. um, and all those stupid sayings, but it's true. You have to, you have to not be afraid to fail in order to succeed. Cause if you're afraid to fail, you're never going to take that step that you have to get around. The, oh my God. I can't tell you how many times we faked it. So yeah, that, right. so that the clients right. didn't know that you were totally screwed up or that something blew <laughs> up or that you, you erased the bass track or something. I mean, I went to, went to a recording session, a, a famous guy, famous producer, Phil Ramone said, come on, how we were going to, we went to AM records to see Herb Albert had this digital machine. And so Herb is playing his wife's tape and it's L- and Lanny Hall and they're playing the song and I don't hear any bass on the on the on the song at all there's no bass and there's it's 32 tracks or four, 20, i don't know how many tracks of digital recordings and i look back and the record light is on the bass track and i reached over and i stopped the machine and they all looked at me what are you doing and i said uh, i think you should play this back because somebody pushed the wrong button and oh. you know I, I i i had dinner with herb albert uh, last year uh, two years ago um and he told me the story, re, retold me the story of that happening. But it was with these two guys. I'm, I'm like, oh my God, it's, you know, Herb Albert, a you know, billionaire from playing, what he call himself, mm-hmm. a bar mitzvah trumpet player that got lucky. <laughs> <laughs> that was his description of himself. And Phil Ramone, who was a violin player on, uh, uh, what is it, the Ted Mack Amateur Hour. Phil Ramone was a violin player and he came in second to a comedian by the name of Morty Gunty, who sucked. He was a Catskill comedian, but that's who beat Phil Ramone. I mean, Billy Joel and Simon and Garfunkel and you know the story. Oh boy. So these are, these are, these are, uh, he wasn't my mentor, but I sure watched everything he did. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. 
Absolutely. That's that the, the being exposed. So much of it's this exposure. You know, uh, with a few minutes that we have before we have some questions, I did want to talk about becoming a mentor. Now, now, because we're talking about here, like finding mentors in in ever all around us, right? And and it just naturally sometimes just happens through chemistry and whatnot. But there is also um, I've had a lot of uh, experienced people ask me and and say, I, I really want to mentor people. I want to become a mentor. How do I do that? Like very specifically say that. And um, I'm I'm curious, like you know, Howie, that is something that you put on your tagline. You're a mentor. That is one of the things you do right now. Yep. Um, what are some things you want to say about that? You know, like, like comparing and contrasting your experiences, you know, of becoming a mentor as a byproduct of leadership, you know, versus actively pursuing being a mentor. What advice Experience. would you give people? In order, to, in order to pass on, a lot of my things are not, are, these are not rules. These are experiences that somebody like you, not you, but somebody like a mentee mm -hmm. is going to go through. And that's what I'm that as a mentor, that's, that's how I do it. I tell stories of, I'm a storyteller and I tell stories of what happened to me in the 45 years that I've been doing this. I mean, I really started when I was 18 years old, so, so I'm a little older than that, but anyway, so a person has to have a lot of experience. I mean, Karuna's worked for uh, 10 companies, let's say, and you, you, and, and you've had a different position in each one and each one is better and better. And you have all this experience from all of that, those people you've absorbed all this experience. And, and it's like, uh, okay, I got a spice from India and I got a spice from Japan and I got a spice from Australia and I'm going to put that all together and I'm going to make this soup. And yes. so that's, that's what I try to pass on to people because no, you're not any different. I mean, uh, a mentee is not any different than any of us, except they're at, you know, step two and, and mm -hmm. we're at step 427. Mm -hmm. And so if I can make somebody's, I mean, Maurizio just said, made my day, you know, the stuff we're talking about. And I'm going, yeah. oh my God, that's, that's, you know, like this, I get a goodie button for that. Yeah. Um, that here's a, here's a, uh, I mean, these are people I know that are in the chat. So <laughs> it's, it's fun hearing how they feel about what I'm saying, yeah. which is why I'm a mentor. Yeah. I get a kick out of helping people if they, if they get one thing right, that's all it is. Uh, if it's one thing that they're better today than they were yesterday, because I helped them do it. I'm happy. Yeah. Yeah. It's like Karuna says, like, you know, when, when somebody jumps in and does the work, you know, and, and shines and sparks and whatnot, it's like, you want to spend all the time in the world with them because mm -hmm. they're worth it because you know, you're going to see this massive thing for your investment of time. That's two and words thank you. <laughs> when they say thank you and they call you up and say, thank yeah. you. What you said was blah, blah, blah. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. It's the best. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's really, why'd you, why'd you spend all those years doing the same thing? You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I never did the same thing twice, but I sure learned and I got lots of scars. I cut my fingers, you know, the tips mm -hmm. of my fingers with razor blades, you know, we've all done all the stupid stuff and burned myself and, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> but <laughs> we get uh, sewing needles in our fingers and things. And right. Whatnot, right. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. There's all, there's, there's blood, blood and all of these things yeah. as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as some last advice in here, um, I just wanted to say, okay. So post COVID advice, for those looking for mentors to become a mentor, like things have shifted. And I've kind of left this question wide open with a like, hmm, what do we want to you know, say? I don't really have any directive here. But with, with COVID happening in this last year, 15 months of everything changing, people are changing a lot of directions. That's where a lot of people are looking for mentors. They're looking for things like this to connect. Um, you know, what's some, some words you want to impart to the audience today? around that well i don't agree with that so um, what do you mean 
I don't know if I made a statement that it could no, be agreed. Uh, Did I? Um, so <laughs> it's, I, I, it's just because COVID is over, um, right? Doesn't doesn't mean that you shouldn't do what you were doing before then, because mm -hmm. if you're if if somebody's looking for a mentor to help them with the next step or to find a job, or are you going into a business that's, a, you know, there, or are you trying to change career paths because of your experience of not being able to work or, you, you know, what you did doesn't exist anymore. That's mm -hmm. a, then you need to talk to somebody that's like a coach, but is that a mentor? Because if you're looking for a job, a mentor is not the right person to talk to. Right, right, right. Talk to somebody in HR, you know, lie on your resume that you can do something that you might want to do and send it out and see if anybody, you know, it's like throwing a worm in the, and see what you can get. But mm -hmm. um, if you want to change careers, I'll talk to somebody as long as your attitude's right. Yeah. But why, yeah. are you, you know, a lot of times, why are you changing your career? They were good at it before COVID. And it's just yeah. so you took 18 months off, you know, well, and you got unemployment yeah. insurance for 18 I months. I think yeah. there's two things happening that I'm I'm really excited about coming out of COVID. Number one is is um, I think people really are questioning the value of how they spend their time. And that's driving a lot of the change that you're talking about, Michelle. And I think that's a great yeah. thing to question. You know, we all have a limited time in this earth. I don't, I don't think any of us should be wasting on the things we don't care about. So mm -hmm. like, you gotta, you gotta make money. You gotta support your family. You might have things right. you gotta pay for, but if you can find a way to do that, doing something you care about or work towards that every day, you know, that's worth doing. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I think that's happening is like people, they don't, they don't want all this crap physically right. or mentally. They want a, a better experience that's simpler. Right. And everyone's stuck in their house with all their crap for a long time, whether it was like the crap up here or like their stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think there's like a very parallel physical and mental experience that's happening where we're like, we, we want a clean house. We want to be surrounded by the yeah. things we care about. And we want to be engaging in the things we care about. So it's Marie kind of this right. Yeah. This right. right. Yeah. Although I kind of, I kind of, I'm kind of mad at her for like making the bar so high. You know? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Oh, it doesn't bring you joy. <laughs> I don't know how to how you can really be mad at her if you actually talk to her, but I'm a little mad. A little mad. Yeah. So, um, so, uh, uh, so I think that right now, like that searching, you know, that searching to me is like a very inspiring feeling, and yeah. and and I and I get excited, especially with people who've always kind of like done what they're supposed to do their whole lives, and they step back for a minute, and they're like, "Why am I doing this?" You know, I get very excited mm -hmm. by that, right? So, so I, I think if you're in a position where you're ready for change. And you want to find people who are going to inspire you and help you figure out how to, how to basically move towards self-realization. Mm -hmm. Like that's a worthy thing. And you, you knock on their door and you ask them to be a mentor. Like, I think you have to do that shamelessly. You can do it very politely. You can do it very mm -hmm. respectfully. You do whatever you think is going to work to get them to talk to you and spend time mm -hmm. with you. Just tell so, them the truth too. You have yeah. to tell the truth. Yeah. From a Don't mentor relationship, me. it's like you, you go, you, you, you got to go after just if you saw like, somebody, if you fell in love with somebody and you gotta, you gotta tell them, you know what I mean? You gotta, you gotta right. go after it. If you feel it, if you need it, if you want it and you find that person and, go for and it. have no shame, you never know what's going to happen. And maybe somebody who's super famous on like LinkedIn or Instagram or whatever. And you just say like, I'm looking for this. It's fine. Yeah. If they, you know. um, yeah. On the flip side though, if you want to be a mentor and you want to give back, that's a little bit more complicated. I think there's a lot of ways to do it, but you have to put yourself in a position where that's a little more structured, where you're offering that space to people and you're finding people who need you. And that really, I think mm -hmm. does happen through an organization. Um, you know, yeah. how he's done it a different way, but, um, but I, I, I think if that's, if you're looking to kind of give back from a mentor position, then there's a lot of organizations where you can do that. And you just find the one where you think you can be of most service really. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There was a, there was a, a statistic we were talking about 70 some percent, I think 74 percent of Fortune 500 companies have mentoring programs, you know, like in the company. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about different organizations too outside of companies. Yeah. But, you know, there are a lot of companies that provide mentoring, you know, options. People just don't utilize them, I guess. But, um, but yeah, I, I agree with that, um, you know, that that both of you, you know, like that the change and finding going after the mentor is really, really good. And I think there's something like uh, what you were saying, Howie is like, 
if you're looking for a new job or a real distinct direction, I think that's where a career coach or a life coach or, you know, coaching comes into play. And I, I, you know, my mentor who happened to be a manager, my manager, she ended up being my mentor. And then she left to become a life coach. Um, (laughs) And I did coaching with her for seven years. Um, But, and, and it it really helped because I used it really career and life becoming a mom changing careers, going to a big job. Um, and I had really distinct, she went through a life coaching program so that she became a a specific coach, but it was very different than mentoring. Um, and it was a paid type of thing, whereas mentoring is not. So, so those are those, some of those distinctions of, of what they, they do. So I think what you said is right on in terms of a mentor does this, but if you're looking for somebody to help you find a new job, you need some coaching, you need something else, you know, somebody to help you do that, you know? So anyway, uh, just to kind of cap that off and, and, and agree with that. I, I want to see if there's any questions. We're running out of our time here. Um, oh, there are. Wow. Okay. A question for Karuna. I'm going to dive right in. So far, so far till now, which fashion trend was the best trend in your opinion? I don't know what this has to do with mentoring. <laughs> you want to answer it quick? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I'm going to say... My favorite fashion trend of all time are socks and sandals because it's so divisive and (laughs) it's so dramatic. Um, And I, and, and I, I love wearing socks with my sandals. So I'm just going to put that. (laughs) Oh, I love it. I love it. Okay. And then another one for Karuna. Can you talk about the key differences between the Canadian and U S fashion industry? Oh, that these are, these are a little long. Can you come up with maybe one or two things that are distinctly different? Yeah. Um, the American industry is much bigger. Canada is way smaller. I mean, I think mm-hmm. that's the biggest difference and that breeds a more provincial attitude in Canada where people don't feel like they can move as much. They don't have as much freedom. Like if you're in New York or even LA at this point and you you want to quit your job, you're going to get another one the next day it's out there. You know, mm-hmm. whereas here, mm-hmm. I think people are a lot more scared to move around um, and there aren't as many doors open to you. So you get people who are kind of um, there's not as much movement, there's not as much growth, but you also get people who kind of stay in one company and grow up in a company for decades and decades and decades. Like that really still happens quite a lot in Canada. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's definitely, definitely different. Um, another question in here, I read in Lean In, the book Lean In from uh, Cheryl Sandberg, that more women feel the need to be mentored and seek mentors than men. In either of your experiences, have you found that to be true? And I mentioned that a little bit in my talking too. Howie, what's your answer to that? More women feel the need to be mentored. I think that mentors. I think that um, men men's egos don't let them go to it because they don't they don't I don't need any help. I'll figure it out. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, it's a bullshit thing to say. Um, uh, and they'll eventually learn to do that. I think that um, when I I always knew that I wasn't invincible. And so I was, I, I was, you know, I, as I said, I copied people. That was an easy way to say, well, I got to meet this person and I hung out enough so that I could have some of their knowledge rub off on me. Mm-hmm. Or I would, um, you know, I would have a wine tasting and invite all these, this disparate group of people. And then I would slip in a question uh, like, I, I wanted to go into the video business of, uh, and I needed my tape machine, my audio machines to sync up with, with the video machines. And I didn't know how to do that. And I had this competitor, uh, for a wine tasting and I got them all liquored up and, uh, I asked him the question, what is the secret? And he told me a thing called house sync. If anybody the people listening might know it's a, it's just a, it's a, it's an atomic clock that you put into the studio so that everything runs off of this clock, as opposed to what Con Ed gives you 60 cycles out of the wall, which is what ran all the audio machines and all the video machines a a long time ago. Anyway, that was the keys to my kingdom when I went into the television business, (laughs) but you have to be, as a mentee, you have to be able to listen. Um, mm-hmm. And you have to, if you have convictions, you have to express them as well. 
so that somebody can say, well, that might not be the right conviction. You know? Yeah, and I've heard that. I've heard you know the comments of uh, you know that kind of feeling of uh, for men not wanting to ask for help and ask the questions and you know and take, <laughs> take the feedback. So yeah, yeah, okay, yes. Maurizio's think- cracking me up. He's like, that's gangster, gangster, <laughs> gangster Don. Don Howie, says- yep. <laughs> okay, so here's a a good one. Actually, I really love this question. Um, uh, what what do you think are the differences finding or being mentored as a freelancer? versus the salaried position in the workplace. Cause we are having more people moving to freelancing. And so finding a mentor can be a little bit more challenging. What are your thoughts? Me? I think actually, no. one. Okay, uh, Karuna, go ahead. Answer, like, I think, I think you can be really bold about just working your connections and asking people for their time because you're not asking them for money. Um, I think you'd be surprised at how many people will give you their time all mm-hmm. over your industry when you're somebody who's working on their own. Like when people approach me and they ask for my time and they're really doing great work and, and, and genuine, um, you might in a weird way have access to a wider variety of people if you kind of have the courage to chase it. Like, yeah. so if you ask 20 amazing people to, to mentor you and three say yes, like that's a fantastic, you right. know, ignore the 17 who said no, right. you know? Right. And so I actually, I don't see that as a barrier. I think in a way, like, the people who will work with you will have more freedom because you don't have an official business relationship. Mm-hmm. So you have to network and do things to also yeah, meet some of these people. Yeah. 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 To connect with them. Another, uh, how you already kind of addressed this. There was a comment in here of, if I wanted to address it, that I worked in the hospitality and customer service for many years, 10 plus. I was very ashamed of that. Thank you for expressing your opinion that that experience can be considered an asset. I just wanted to address that. It wasn't so much a question, but a, a wonderful comment and glad, glad that. Her follow-up is even better because uh, Maurizio said he worked as a bartender for 10 years. And it's, it's that's, a, that mm-hmm. it, it, once you yeah. get that, then it it just stays with you. You just, you don't unlearn mm-hmm. how to take mm-hmm. care of people. Yeah. You know, it's not a matter of putting the fork and the knife in the right place. It's about how do you want to be treated? You know, that's, that's, I mean, if, if you want to be treated like a jerk, then be a jerk. If you want to be treated nicely, treat people nicely. And, you know, you'll, you'll get and, it back. And remember it right now, a lot of restaurants are trying to open back up and people don't want to go back to a lot of those They're jobs, making too so. much money on unemployment. So the, yeah. that's an issue. So, yes, um, yes. Well, that's another you'll topic. You'll see the pay, the, play, <laughs> the pay will go up in the restaurant business, hopefully. Yeah. Um, but it might too. be a little more expensive for us to, to 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 live the way we used to yeah we have um uh, just a, a minute here and i wanted to say there's one question here that for karuna said i'm a recent fashion graduate from parsons what advice do you have for graduates trying to get their foot in the door especially when COVID has really impacted jobs in the fashion industry a little mentor yeah it's a tough time and you have to just like have thick skin what i mean by that is that you just keep going after everything you want all the time until something clicks and you just can't give up and it's just a matter of time you know so that's the thing is like i i had plenty of interviews where i didn't get a job or you know i remember there was one person that i did a project with when i was a student and and we had he was so great and he, he really liked me clearly and i thought he would definitely give me a job and i went here excited to interview with him and he didn't have a job to give me And he just said, you know, this isn't the right time for us to work together. You got to find something else. And I was devastated, you know, because I I somehow had the sense of entitlement that just because we got along, you know, he would pay me money. (laughs) But so the truth is that there's a lot of things going on that are out of your control. And so just expect that it might, you might have to try it 50 times before that one time hits. And if you got to take something that wasn't your dream job, Mm -hmm. take the job, learn something and keep chasing your dream job. Yep. So to be able to be in that space where you continue to chase the thing you really want and accept what, what, what life is giving you at the same time, that's, yeah. that's the space you got to be in, but it's a hard space to be in yeah. because you feel like, you know, you, you, you have to have the humility to take what, what you can get. And at the same time, never stop trying to like go where you feel like your destiny is going to take. Yeah. Right. Also put, you put your comments in the chat so that people can reach out to you or your connection. So there's people um, here you can connect to yeah. the other thing is is that no job is forever i say it all the time no job is forever unless your job is 
Uh, well, you put your name on the door and you keep your business open as long as possible, but you could get fired from that too. So just remember that a career is different than a job, mm-hmm. you know, and you know, your passion is the thing that you should either do in your spare time or try to do it to make money, but don't give up your passion. If you love music, yeah. but you can't get a job in the music business, go do something else and just, you know, when you're not working, making money, enjoy the music and, you yeah. know, enjoy being an artist, be the designer, whatever it is, yeah. but don't give up, you know, all, as George Martin said, always remember the music, just, it's just, you, you can't give it up. It's yeah. just, um, because you might not get that job in the business. That's mm-hmm. why we do other things. And well, so, say, another thing is that if you can figure out how to do it financially, because everyone's in a different situation, if you can find somebody who will let you work even just for free, that's like mm-hmm. a brand you respect, a name you respect that has connections, mm-hmm. work for free. Like I worked so many internships for free and I think that's illegal now, but, mm-hmm. <laughs> but, um, but yep. I, sometimes there are people that just didn't, you know, it's a small company. It was a cool designer. They didn't have enough money. And so I would just work for them 10 hours a week but and i would do it for free but it still started building my experience building my relationships and then the minute an opening came up of course i was the first person they would offer it to but you just got to kind of keep trying every angle you can really yeah when when i first came to new york i would just you know find out who was working in what studio and i said can i come with you and and my favorite was is a friend of mine was a cello player for the New York Philharmonic. And I used to go to rehearsals every day and sit in Lincoln Center with Leonard Bernstein conducting the Philharmonic and watching the New York Philharmonic. And I just sat there every day. And one day somebody said, you're here every day. What, you you want to work? And I said, sure. And I handed out programs for five minutes. But it was, mm-hmm. it was still was, you know, that was a I would go look for work in the morning and then I go to rehearsals one o'clock in the afternoon. It was just that's how you start until I got a job. So, yeah. Well, we are out of time. We're over time by a couple of minutes and I know we could keep going. And I had a, another question I won't, I'm not going to be able to get to, but I wanted to say thank you so much. Um, Karuna, Howie, you, you guys have some great advice, great stories. And I think it's the sharing of the stories. It's not just the advice. It's the sharing of your experiences and the stories. That's why we do this at Structure. That's why, you know, that that is mentoring right here, too. Um, that it, it helps. So thank you so much for being here and sharing these pieces of advice and tidbits and whatnot. Um, and uh, yeah. That's all I have to Thank say. <laughs> I, 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 I'm just going to say that I think structure is a really important platform for um, people. I'm honored to be able to, to be a speaker again. And, and I, I'm just so glad that we're doing this again, because I think it's so important to have a forum for all of us to come together and talk about, um, you know, how to kind of work and thrive and live and explore in a creative, creative community. Yeah. Thank you. Thank I you still so have much. a lot of stories to tell. <laughs> so well, we'll, we'll have to do more hours. <laughs> we'll have to do a long form interview, Howie, for the YouTube channel. Okay. Because I know people want to hear them too. So we will do that because we're building the structure YouTube channel and we'll get more going. This will be up later on this week so people can watch it again. And uh, we'll uh, we'll see you all soon. So we're going to sign off, say thank you. Thank you to all the guests and um, everyone have a good night. All right. Thank you. See you soon. Turn off your cameras and your...